Hi there, my name is Memo, this is my channel, House Planty Goodness, and essentially it's a place where I like to geek out about my big passion. You might be able to see some of it behind me, it's tropical houseplants. So today is going to be a continuation of the plant review series, but with a bit of a twist. I asked all of you a few weeks back now actually, whether or not we're kind of getting to the point now where some of my kind of rarer plants that I've had for a long time, it's been a year almost since I've posted their initial review. And I asked, look, do, does anybody want to do a bit of an update video a year later to see if something was, if I had something for four years, if now that it's at five years, would it be any different? And a lot of you said, yes, you'd be interested to see this. So today, I'm basically going to start with the furthest review back, basically. So from the catalog, I think the first one will be the one that we're going to be doing today. And today's update review is going to be on the Philodendron gloriosum. And I know this is a very popular plant with a lot of us. So I will be inserting clips in and around the video. I don't know if anybody has been around since that initial video, but it was tricky to film because of where my gloriosum is. I will also see about moving the camera with me a few times. I might get some point of view shots as well, just so I can kind of talk you through some of the things that have happened in the last year. But before we get into any of that, let's lay down some ground rules. So if you're coming back, welcome back. Hopefully you'll enjoy this video, especially if you've seen the first one. As always, you know that you can check the progress bar down below and it can, you can jump to your favorite topic, essentially. If you are new joining, however, welcome to the slight insanity that is this plant review series. Now, the ground rules are mainly going to be for the newbies joining now, essentially. And it is that the big one is there is no way that I can make this review unbiased. It is my biased experience and my biased review growing my specific plant, or in this case, plants, plural, in my space, which is a conservatory in the UK. And whatever that might mean in terms of light levels, humidity levels, heat in the summer, cold in the winter, dryness, too much humidity, all of the above. So bear that in mind when you're looking at my review. However, as I always say in these videos, if you've got your own plant with your own experiences and you want to share it with everybody, this is what I'm hoping these videos will become, a repository of information where people can go and check in and see, ah, I'm thinking about buying this plant or I've just bought this plant. How are people growing it? What successes have they had? What failures have they had? Let's see if we can teach each other essentially a thing or two about keeping these plants happy. So drop that down below. Try to be as descriptive as you possibly can. So what light is it getting? Kind of how often are you watering it? What your conditions might be? How long have you had it for? All of these things will really help people in the comments to really get some real kind of answers about questions that they might have growing this specific plant, in this case, the Philodendron gloriosum. But yeah, I have prattled on for far too long for this intro section. Let's move into the first topic. Now the background on this plant and some of this some of this specific section might be a bit of a repetition from the first video but for the newbies that are joining now I got this plant where it was less available. I know at least here in the UK it's become a lot more available now. I can almost see this plant crop up in garden centers and regular plant stores. Not that often and I'll touch on that on availability but when I was looking for it there was only a few of them coming out onto the market. This was a good few years back now. The video will have how long I have had this plant for now, so a year later than the previous one. But yeah, it's it's one of those things that were there were there were kind of influxes of it coming into the market, but it would go super quickly, super, super quickly. And I never kind of got a chance to get this plant. However, for a birthday of mine, a good few years back when I first got this plant, or the first one of the two, which interestingly enough, on the previous video was the bigger one of the two. I think at the moment, actually no, the, the first plant that I got was the smaller one of the two, and there's a struggling story which I'll dive into in just a moment. But the second one, which was the bigger one, might not be anymore. So I will show you in just a bit. But yeah, I got the first plant. I got it from 
a seller on Instagram, a relatively well-known seller on Instagram, who was working with another YouTuber at that point to sell the plant. Generally, I think most people have had good experiences buying from this individual or from this entity, essentially. Uh, it wasn't great for me because I think I got the Gloriosum and I got my first <laughs> Vici. And I can show you that first Vici to see how much it has struggled. Bear with. So however many years later, it's the last remaining old leaf. This wasn't from when I first got it. And this is the newest leaf. I can gladly say that this is slowly bouncing back. This has struggled since day one. Let me put this back and I'll kind of dive into a bit more of the why. So the reason why that specific plant was struggling as much as it was is because it pretty much came to me with hardly any roots, that most of it had root rot. Same thing was true for the Gloriosum. Now, having done an import recently from Equigenera and having seen how sometimes the philodendrons, when they've got the thinner roots, can struggle quite a bit. And actually, the Gloriosum does have relatively thin roots from what I've seen for a philodendron. They're not the chunkiest, basically. But yeah, they can struggle with shipping. And I think what these individuals were doing is pretty much getting it in and sending it out straight away. So this plant was already in shock. The roots had already disintegrated into nothing. There was a bit of assistance that was offered. It wasn't great. The initial reaction should have been, we're really sorry. A, we should have been clear. We should have shown this. And if you're really unhappy, we'll send you a refund instead of this. We'll see how it goes and do this. And no, you shouldn't have done that. And I'm just like, no, this shouldn't be a debate. Take ownership if you know that the plants that you're sending out might have issues, basically. So yeah. suffice it to say, I have never ordered from that entity since. And I don't think I really ever will. So, And it was mainly because of this bad experience, because this is a plant I finally got super excited and it's turned sour so quickly because it came to me and it was basically i had to start from scratch it was a relatively large plant i'll see if my plant care app if i've got some photos of both that initial gloriosum and the vti and add them here i think i might do they had quite a few leaves and they were quite good established plants and yes i know with imports and i've learned this now when i did my own equigenera kind of import Yes, you probably will be starting off with a chunk. For the prices that I was paying, that was a bit much. But anyway, this was a plant that you can get that easily back then. So I had to restart from scratch. I was a bit sour, to say the least. I think I still am a bit at this point, many years later. That was a bit possibly one of my worst experiences buying a plant. So I'll be honest with that one. However, I did find a lovely individual online on Instagram. And this was just an individual. And I don't know what ever happened to this person because I don't see them as often online anymore. I don't know whether or not they kind of fell out of love with houseplants, but I managed to buy a replacement Gloriosum and also, and I think they were based in Scotland. And um, so it was local and it was also a locally grown plant within their own collection, basically. So it wasn't gonna have quite as much of a shock to the system. And my birthday is around May. So the weather was okay to ship some of these things back. Because was, I think by this point, it might have already been June. So it was, it was warm enough that it shouldn't have stressed the plant too much to come from Scotland to England. So it was fine. Uh, and I think that was a, the same order that I got my unknown Anthurium. And I'll link a video at the top there because I did a review from that. Which this, it's still a topic of hot debate as to whether or not what it might be. I bought it back then as a Metallicum. And that's what that individual had the plant sold to them as. And it was crispy as all hell. And I'll, again, I will add a picture here. But since I had it in my care, it has grown huge. Is it a Metallicum? Is it a Magnificum? Is it a hybrid? It's probably a hybrid after quite a few videos and quite a few discussions with everybody. But still love, love it nonetheless. It's absolutely one of my largest anthuriums. And I can see it at the top there now. It does the usual thing that it does in the winter. And I have tried a whole bunch of different things over the winter with that specific plant. And doesn't matter what I do, it almost kind of goes into dormancy, basically. I think it pretty much, it goes from wanting a lot of water in the summer to wanting zero water in the winter almost. And it pretty much will drop most of its leaves, barring one, which is what it's doing at the moment. But it's done it every winter. So I'm hopeful that when the, when the summer comes, it will bring out a new flush of leaves. It has done it every year since then, so that's fine. This is a very tangenty background section, but it's all part of the wider story. That second Gloriosum has since become 
my main Gloriosum, and I rehabbed the first one that I bought, the one with all the root rot and everything. And it's been interesting because that has grown really well. And in the last year, that plant, which is behind me, it's in the most awkward place. I will see if I can lift you and show you, has grown substantially. So it's quite good. And I will take you and show you now how <laughs> I will say it, the mess is real and it's tangled up within the actual shelving unit. I will be chopping and propping it. But let me show you. Right, you might be able to see it right there in the background. You can see some of its crispy leaves as well. You can mainly see the backs of the leaves here. But if I just pan you down so you can see quite how much it's grown, and I'll bring you in behind as well so you can see where the growing tip is. I'm going to have real struggles. But essentially what I'm going to do, I'm going to have to cut it because it has essentially vined around the shelf and underneath the shelf and there's very little things that I can do to it. Obviously you can see how it's growing. It has got an awful lot of leaves. Ignore the crispiness because a lot of that happened in the summer when we had a bit of a heat wave, but it has done quite well. I have had to chop off some of the leaves because they were getting kind of in the way and I have had, you might be able to see that one leaf that is kind of angling itself and I'll see if I can show you where the newest leaf is. It is kind of there and it's getting ready to open up. And whilst we're at it, I thought I might as well show you the second plant that I bought, the one that is the largest. And you can see kind of how it's growing again, apologies for the mess, but you can see how it's kind of falling down out of its pot. That terracotta looks like it's been used and abused, but it is a tangly mess of leaves some of them are looking a bit crusty and dusty there is one leaf that is right there which again seems to be struggling but it seems to be doing okay but and you might be able to see the led lights there and for the people that have been here for a while that is a new leaf for the anthurium esmeraldans so you can kind of see what i was talking about there in terms of how the plant has, both the plants actually, have developed. But yes, I think that's everything I wanted to say about a very, in this very long background section for this video, because it's the first one of these I'm doing. I might rename this as background and update. So coming into the next topic, which is speed of growth. I can say definitely after this long of owning both of my philodendron gloriosums and also chopping and propping and giving a few to friends that they are consistent growers. Fast, yes. Does it get faster now that I've had it for another year? Does it get any faster in the summer? Marginally, I don't know whether or not you would necessarily notice it. And again, the 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 caveat that I will put here is that within my conservatory, I keep the temperature relatively stable. This is the coldest the conservatory has ever been. The conservatory has ever been throughout the words, the throughout the winter. And um, it's doing okay still. It doesn't seem to be one of the plants that really is struggling. And again, I'll benchmark it like I normally do against a golden pothos. If a golden pothos will bring out two or three leaves in the summer. This one will probably do the same, maybe not three, but maybe two in the summer. You, for the eagle-eyed on the previous section, you might have seen that my one, the second philodendron gloriosum that I had, had two stems coming out of it. It is because I chopped and propped it and it kind of branched out. So the initial growing point was one and it split into two because obviously it branched out. Apical dominance, and I have got another video about scientific terms and what apical dominance is. If you want to check it out, I'll link it at the top. But yes, it is a plant that does grow relatively consistently and relatively fast. This is probably the reason why so many people fell in love. One of the many reasons, but that fell in love with the Gloriosum and stayed in love with the Gloriosum. This is an interesting plant, I find, that from a lot of the rare or difficult to find house plants i don't think i don't know how difficult this is anymore to find it used to be very difficult to find but this is one that has consistently stayed 
of interest to a lot of people, and people still love their Gloriosans many years later, including myself. But I'll talk about that in the very final bit with the final thoughts. So this is one of the reasons, I think. It's because it's a consistent grower. When it does get established, because I know I've spoken to a few people and they've kind of said, well, you know, it can be a bit tricky for it to get established. I will not refute that. And actually, that is a good point. Let's move on to the next topic, which is ease of propagation, because this kind of ties in quite nicely with ease of propagation. So coming into the topic of ease of propagation, it is an interesting one because because of the way that it grows and the way that it grows kind of on top of the soil level. And you saw with both of my pots previous in the previous bits in the background section that they're all kind of falling off the pots. I will talk a bit more and in more detail about that in care and accessories, essentially. But it's an interesting one because the only way that I've been able to propagate it essentially is to put some moss over that growing stem on top of the soil, kind of essentially emulating what would be air layering and letting that root in, which it will do quite readily, and then chopping it off from the main plant. It creates the least amount of stress to the new propagate and to the mother plant, I found. And in all fairness, it's the only thing that I have ever tried with this plant. But I've had really, really good success with it, really fast success with it as well. And I know because I gave I gave a few cuttings to friends and they were saying, oh, it does take a beat. I would agree with that because I essentially when I got my second Gloriosum, I got it as a rooted cutting. It did take a moment to establish itself. It's also really interesting because the moment that a cutting starts establishing itself and starts growing its stem on top of the soil level, that's when you really start seeing faster growth. And the moment that that happens, it does happen a lot faster. I will kind of benchmark this against my Philodendron Burley Marks Variegata, because to me, that's an interesting, and I'll, that is probably going to be one of the other update videos coming up soon. That one will root out a lot. So you, if you've got clear pots, you will see all the roots coming out, but nothing will be happening at the top for a good few months. At least it has been in my experience. Granted, I've only ever tried to do that in the winter. I don't know if in the summer it'd be a bit faster. Um, it's not quite as slow as that, but it does take a beat to get established. If you're patient with it, it should be fine. I have propagated this plant or essentially grown it from a rooted cutting in lower, con lower humidity conditions than my conservatory and it was fine. This isn't a plant that at least in my experience is too, too fussy when it comes to Kind of the humidity levels, it might need that much more humidity if it's trying to establish itself. I am pretty sure at this point with both of my plants, when they're this established, as long as I do the transition well into slightly lower humidity, they will probably be okay. I might just need to keep an eye out a bit more for <laughs> spider mites because spider mites and velvet leaf plants <laughs> match made in heaven, unfortunately. But yeah, I think that's all I want to say about the ease of propagation with this one, let's move into the next topic. So I touched briefly on availability just a moment ago, but I will kind of dive into it a bit more and give you an update in terms of availability. So again, when I was first getting it, not that many of them around, it wasn't stupidly expensive, I don't think, even back then. So you're looking at worst, I think that it got was very, very low treple digits, I think. Uh, I was able to get it slightly lower than that, basically, because I was in the double digits. But it was still a relatively pricey plant. I have seen these plants now, however many years later, and there's a difference even since the last video that I posted of this review, it has come down significantly. So at least here in the UK, they're a lot more available to find. There's not that kind of thing that I had, which was, they're on the market, go, 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 bye, 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 bye. And they're all gone. You can get them. They, they're still in stock with a lot of places. I think you can probably do a Google search at the moment. And at least a few retailers, online retailers, would have a version of this plant. It might not be a big plant, because that was the thing as well when we were buying back then, you were getting much a plant with much larger leaves. So you were speeding up a bit in terms of the maturity of the plant. So you, you had a slightly more mature plant to begin with. So the 
yes, the gloriosum, and I should have mentioned this in the uh, propagation section, but when you do the cutting, the old leaf will obviously, if it's a mature plant, will still be a mature leaf. It will have a slightly more juvenile leaf for the next leaf or two. So it will be smaller and then slowly size up. But generally with the gloriosum, I found that within two or three leaves since that first one, when, you, when you're propagating, you're back to whatever size it was originally. So you've got back when I bought mine, uh, back in the good old days, <laughs> it was that we were getting slightly more mature cuttings. I think there's a lot more kind of younger plants that are coming onto the market now, but they grow so fast that it shouldn't really be an issue. But the, the very long way of me saying that you can get them, they're a lot more available. You can get them in more places at the moment, at least here in the UK. I would imagine to a certain point, maybe in the EU and maybe in the States now, correct me. And I'm sure you, you all do like to update me on these things. And I love hearing it, especially from people from like, far-flung places like Indonesia, Australia, America, and you're all kind of like going to mention down below. It's just like, I know it's not that available still here. I love hearing this because it's really interesting to see how different countries have got availability of certain plants. But yeah, I think at the moment you can probably get this plant for low, mid to low double digits. I'm pretty sure you can probably get it for a bit lower. At least I've seen it once or twice, and I'm just like, ha, 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 we paid so much money. But this is what happens. And I think this is a reality that you need to remember with specific expensive or slightly pricey, rarer or difficult plants to find within the house plant market. If you're not in a desperate need to buy it when it's really trending, but you really like the look of a plant and you've got some patience, I've got none. But if you do have the patience and you can wait even for a year, year and a half, two years, I guarantee you the trend so far over the years is that those prices will drop and drop considerably. I'm not even going to touch on how much variegated added Sonia cost when it first came out and how much it costs now. <laughs> that's an extreme example, but that's what I'm saying. It's uh, Prices will fluctuate and they will eventually drop. So that's something always worth remembering because even since the last video that I was doing, the prices are even lower now, so a year later. So something to just remember. Moving into the topic of pests. And the pests are kind of the same pests that I talked about on my previous video are still the same pests that I occasionally get on this plant. I might occasionally get a mealybug on a leaf here and there, but it's because it's around other plants that might have mealybugs. I don't think they would naturally gravitate towards it. The big one for the gloriosum, at least in my experience, is spider mites. Even in here with the higher humidity, although I will caveat that and say in the summer is when I see most of it, which is generally for most of us when you'll see most pests, and at least in volume. But in the summer, I usually have the window open and it also does get really dry in here. With the current conservatory, hopefully we'll be ordering the new conservatory in the next couple of weeks. And hopefully by summertime, there will be a new conservatory. And you best be believing that if I'm going to have to move all of these plants out of here in order for them to build a new conservatory and move them back in, I will be reshuffling everything. And at that point, before I make it too messy, I will be doing another conservatory tour for you and it will be an update and hopefully something that isn't messy. Can't guarantee it. The people that have been here for a while know that uh, mess is a thing that tends to happen around me a lot. And it's taken me this many years to realize that I'm okay with it, it's, it's fine. But yeah, it is one of those things with this one that spider mites are gonna be still, however many years later, it's gonna be the thing that I just look out for during the summer months. And I'll just double check some of the leaves. And even looking at it now, it looks like there might be at least some spider mites on this. It never really gets out of control too much because I spot them, spray them. It's fine. This is a plant. This is the reality with a lot of my plants. I don't ever, I will spray them once. Technically, I should be going back two weeks later and two weeks after that to do it. Oh, this is one that I have never done it. I've only ever sprayed it once and it clears it up. But that, 
don't take that as gospel. That's just been maybe my plant in my conditions. I might be fortunate. And if I am, I'm very glad that I am fortunate. But yeah, I think that's the big one. Pest is mainly going to be spider mites for this one. I don't think I've ever had thrips on this. Even when I had the white fly, this wasn't a plant that it necessarily gravitated towards. I'm just trying to see behind it. No, this is a plant, however, and I'm looking at the back of the leaves and I'll hopefully be inserting clips around this that does occasionally get edema. So, and I'll talk a bit more about the edema in the next section. So coming into accessories and care, and I will do a bit more of an update on this one than I did on my previous video. So again, I'll hopefully be inserting clips here where you can see the big thing that I want to talk about is that growing stem that grows along the top line of the soil, especially if you're intending to grow this plant for many years. And I hope you will do because it is a very impressive, very showy type plant. So the thing that I've learned, and we we pretty much, we, I say most of the people on YouTube that have talked about the Gloriosum, we've all said the same thing. It's good to get a kind of a trough planter, which is a kind of longer planter where the kind of plant grows on top of the soil line. So, because if you get a small round pot and it wants to crawl, it will come off the, the side of the pot really, really quickly. That growing stem will drop off. But you saw even with mine, where they're slightly longer pots, granted the, the first one that I bought, the smaller of the two technically still, uh, although give it time, I think that was gonna be bigger actually. It kind of, that one had a, a bit more of a rounder pot, but it was a shallower pot. It doesn't need a deep pot necessarily, but it does need a long pot. Really, really consider that. And I def desperately need to do it with my big one, the second one that I bought. Chop it, propagate it, and potentially add it back in just because it will keep falling off the side of the pot. And the one thing I will say, so let me see if I can grab something and show you what it might look like and where you might need to take the cut. Actually, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to show you straight onto the plant. So you can see how it's dropping down there. And again, apologies for the mess. But you can see if I was to kind of cut it right here, all that's going to happen is that's going to branch out and still fall off the side of the pot. I would need to be cutting a lot further back. So it's still got some kind of groundwork to walk towards. And what I might then do is add some of the cuttings right there at the back, because I don't know whether or not you might be able to see, it's quite barren back there and it's all, it's all happening here basically. So I would want to refill that area to just get a fuller plant. So that is the big thing that I, I would say after however many years I've had this plant, just knowing when or how far back to cut so you can kind of truly maximize that pot. Now, the reality is with the first one that I have, the smaller one of the two, because it's in that shallower, still wide, but round pot, that would be tricky to do. If I'm going to be, and I probably will need to repot that at some point, I will put it into a bit more of a trough just to kind of get it going. I know that I, when I spoke to a few people, they were struggling to find terracotta. I would prefer to use terracotta with that because it helps me control the moisture. And I'll come back to that in just a moment terracotta trough pots, I would say, and this is how I found mine, don't look for a terracotta trough pot in houseplant sections. I'm thinking now more of kind of like garden centers, not in the houseplant section. Look for it in the garden section. That's where I found mine. And it was a lot more affordable <laughs> than some of the terracotta pots that are being sold to houseplant owners. So if you've got the luxury of being able to do that, check there, that might, you might find it there. And on to the point of why I would use, I would still want to use terracotta with this plant is, and again, hopefully I've got some clips that I'm adding here, of edema. So edema is kind of inconsistencies with watering. And I found with a lot of my plants, when they get edema, they almost always tend to be in plastic pots because there's inconsistencies of maybe where the roots are and how they're getting that water. And the, obviously the plastic pots keep the water in a lot longer. This is also a plant that I found quite interesting because for how fine the roots are, initially I'd put it in plastic pots thinking it needs more moisture and it, it can't dry out that quickly. I learned the hard way with my Gloriosum that it does really need to go dry before I water it. It's not even just before it goes dry. It needs to more or less go fully dry. Not by any stretch am I saying that you need to let 
a glorious and go dry and let it be bone dry for days on end. But keeping an eye on it to kind of say, you know what, roughly around this time of the year, I know that at every five or six or seven days, I need to double check the soil and see, is it still a bit damp? If it is, leave it for a couple of days and come back and do it then. What I'm not saying is, oh, it's been five days, I've tested it and it's dry. I'm going to leave it for a few days and then come and water it. No, if you find that it's dry, water it then and there, basically. So don't let it stay dry for too long because then you will stress out the plant. And the, the problem of edema will happen then even if you've got terracotta pot and if you've got a light and airy soil mix because those roots are trying to absorb that water super quickly and it will burst the cells. It's interesting because this is the only philodendron, I'm trying to think now, the only philodendron that I will get edema on I don't think I've done it on, I don't think I've ever had it on any other philodendron, pretty sure. This is something that I've struggled a lot with, with more so alocasias and specifically the dragon scale alocasia, the green one, not the silver one for some reason. But yeah, and it's interesting because this is the first time I've seen an edema on a plant that it really does look like a blister. And I don't think I've got a picture. If I do, I can't make promises. I might see if I can add it here because it was one of those weird, fascinating things that I got, uh, that I saw. And I'm just like, oh, this is bizarre. But literally the leaf had a blister in it that was a lot thicker than the actual, because the gloriosum leaves are not that thick, of just kind of accumulated fluid. And it literally did look like a pimple. So uh, yeah, and the thing with edemas in those situations, <laughs> much like a spot that you might get on the face, it is best to leave it alone. Because the situation is, you might want to drain it. I know it doesn't look great. And I did drain mine. <laughs> uh, it's the same thing when people say, don't touch the spots on your face. But those people still do. Um, when you cut into it to release some of that fluid, you are exposing that kind of sac on the inside to elements. At least if it's self-contained, it shouldn't have that many issues. At least that's the way I think I have read up to it. If anybody's an expert in edema, please drop, drop a comment down below. And maybe drop me a DM on Instagram because I haven't found anybody who's an expert at edemas yet. And I'd love to have a chat with you. But yeah, so that's the big things I'd say about care. Obviously, check for the pests, predominantly spider mites in the summer. Yes, it is in an aroid soil mix. Yes, I do have them both in terracotta. As I mentioned, the humidity needs when it's propagating and rooting in to begin with, yes, might be a bit higher, but eventually you can probably transition this into more household conditions. In terms of light, you've kind of seen where both of them are. So they're both on relatively low shelves. The bigger one that I've got down here that has got the LED strip there, the other one is kind of facing towards the north, basically, and the leaves are all turning that way as well. So it's not a plant that I find needs an awful lot of strong light. That's why this one's low and this one's kind of looking at the lowest light level that I can give it basically. So bear that in mind, which probably actually makes them quite good to have in and around the house. But yeah, I think that's everything I wanted to say about accessories. Let's move on to the final topic. So coming into final thoughts with this one, and I don't think my scoring system is gonna change or my scoring of this plant is going to change. I can't remember what score I gave it. It might be. I'll add a note up here to see if it has changed. But let's do the usual. If I knew it, knowing what I know now, if I didn't have this plant, would I be purchasing it? 100%. Still enjoy this plant. The only caveat that I will say to this, and this is something that I don't think is discussed enough, this is a plant that does crawl, the leaves get huge, it's large and in charge. It is a very awkward plant when it starts getting larger. It will grow in all different directions because it's as large as it is, and it's great. So this might be one that if you know that you've got a space in your house and you want to have a statement plant and you can let it sprawl and get really big and bushy and kind of wide because it will get wide rather than tall, this is definitely one for you. If you've got limited space and you've got a collection, like you can see there, it is almost taking up an entire shelf and it's now encroaching on other plants. So less than ideal conditions for this plant. So that would be the only little caveat I would say is if you've got very limited space, so I'll give you an example, you're growing in an Ikea cabinet, 
this isn't going to survive in an IKEA cabinet for longer than a few months, especially if you're getting it at a root of cutting. It will get it will outgrow most spaces quite quickly. So bear that in mind. If you're happy to just chop it back so it kind of keeps retaining a smaller size and maybe making it bushier by adding those rooted propagates back in, that might be a way to do it. But this is this is a plant that gets big. So the same considerations that you might have if you're buying uh, Monstera Deliciosa, for instance, and, it, and you're you're expecting those huge leaves, you know that at some point that's going to take up a lot of space kind of uh, vertically. This one will be more horizontally, basically. So just bear that in mind. It is something to kind of keep in mind. That's why I said, yes, I will probably get it knowing what I know now. Would I manage it a bit more and chop it back so it doesn't get unruly quite so quickly? Probably. So that's the big thing that I've learned. The scoring that I will do, which is normally... Zero or one being the worst, 10 being the best for this plant generally as a house plant. This is still a solid nine for me. I think I think I had nine for the previous one over this one. This is a good plant. It's relatively straightforward for a philodendron that could be fussy, especially for the velvety leaves. It isn't that much. At least it hasn't been in my experience. I know it will vary. And I've talked to loads of people over the year about how they have found growing the Gloriosum. And it is a true mix. Some people do really well with it, some people don't, but it might just be in the way that we're all growing plants differently. For me, this is a solid nine because it grows consistently, it doesn't have too many issues, it's a large plant, it's an impressive plant, uh, it's just that sprawling nature. And I would imagine, and let me be clear with this one, if I was in a slightly more tropical climate and I could grow this outdoors in my garden, I 100% would. Same thing with alocasias, colocasias, all of these things. Caladiums, are, I love those big, big, heart-shaped leaves. And out of all of those types of leaves where you get those massive heart-shaped leaves, this, for me, at least in a household condition, is the easiest. And I would imagine outdoors would be as well. Anybody from the kind of tropical bits, I think, of Australia, because I know there's a lot of you that might grow this as a garden plant or it's in and around your garden by accident. Let us know down below how you find this or would you ever bring this into your house? Because I know a lot of people might just be, no, absolutely not. This is a beast. It can just stay out there, basically, or I'm trying to get rid of it from my garden. I'm very curious. But yeah, this is a video that's gone on for a bit longer, but it gives you an indication of how passionate I might be about this plant that I can talk about it for as long as I have. Apologies, it's a long video. But yeah, anyway, hopefully you've enjoyed. Hopefully I shall see you here soon. And I truly, truly hope that you have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Bye.